viewers of the channel will be now be quite familiar with the series dealing with the uh, Mark I, Lee Metford. Although not belonging to me, I now have the opportunity to feature a Mark I Lee Enfield on the channel. I thought that a little bit of background, history, and some shooting comparisons with this rifle might be interesting. The Mark I Magazine Lee Enfield was introduced in very late 1895, and was virtually the same rifle that it replaced, the Mark II Star Lee Metford, except for one key aspect, the barrel. When cordite was chosen in 1891 as the smokeless powder for use in service ammunition, one unforeseen characteristic was that it burned very hot. This had the unfortunate effect of wearing the throats out of the barrels prematurely, reducing the life of the barrel considerably. Whereas Metford rifling had arguably been the most successful form then in use, it clearly could not be carried forward upon discovery of this unfortunate lack of resilience. It was decided to revert to a perhaps more conventional form of rifling with deeper, square-sided grooves. This was known as Enfield rifling, as indeed this form of rifling was in use from the 1850s, and a resultant change in name was thus required. From Lee Metford to Lee Enfield. Although outlined in a previous video, that on the introduction of the SMLE, I thought that it might be helpful to review the appropriate sections of the family tree of the Lee series of rifles. The initially named Magazine Rifle, later the Mark I Magazine Lee Metford, was adopted from 1888 and entered service sometime in the early 1890s. Key distinguishing features were its sling placement, the grooves in the stock, the Lewis sights, and the long, skinny eight-round magazine. From 1892, this was modified as the Mark I Star Magazine Lee Metford, with conventional barleycorn sights, a butt disc, no safety catch, and curved edged handguard. Also from 1892, the Mark II Lee Metford was introduced. Not seeing significant overseas and home service until the late 1890s, this mark introduced a newer, lighter stock style without grooves, a 10 round magazine, modified sling placement, and a simplified dust cover on the bolt. Minor differences, such as a brass butt plate, were also featured, as well as the front barrel band being discontinued, being incorporated into the nose cap. From April 1895, the Mark II Star Lee Metford was introduced. This mark saw the reintroduction of the safety catch, only this time on the cocking piece. From November 1895, the Mark I Magazine Lee Enfield was adopted. This was the same rifle as its predecessor, the Mark II Star Lee Metford, but with Enfield rifling. Otherwise, this rifle was identical. Finally, from May 1899, the Mark I Star Lee Enfield was adopted with the only difference being the lack of hole, groove, and nut for the fitting of the clearing rod, which was also made redundant at this time. It's important to understand that the dates reflected in the list of changes are not to be taken literally, although they illustrate the date at which the design was implemented and indeed approved they do not accurately reflect the date that the weapons were actually issued. The dates found in the list of changes must always be taken with a certain degree of context. For instance, although adopted in 1888, the magazine rifle wasn't issued in any quantity until 1890 and indeed many units, even on home service, still had martinis in 1892. The Mark I Star Lee Metford of 1892 figured prominently in the major campaigns of the 1890s. The Pathan Revolt of 1897 and the reconquest of the Sudan in 1898. All other marks of both Lee Metford and Lee Enfield don't even show up in photographs until the very late 1890s. Some are present during Victoria's Diamond Jubilee celebrations of 1897 and in other photos of comparable vintage. In fact, it's not until the Boer War of 1899 that one sees conspicuous evidence of any other mark other than the Mark I Star Lee Metford. In that conflict, all three types can be found in use. The Mark I Star Lee Metford with its distinctive sling placement, the Mark II Lee Metford with its lack of safety and new body style, and the Mark II Star Lee Metford and the Mark I Lee Enfield with their safety catches fitted to the cocking piece. I recently had the opportunity to have as a guest to the channel, Branco, who owns a Mark I Magazine Lee Enfield. And I thought it might be interesting to compare his rifle with my own Mark I Lee Metford. Overall, the rifles are quite similar, with similar profiles and similar lengths.
you might say that these early magazine rifles, both Metford and Enfield, could be categorized into two different quote-unquote body styles. The Mark I and Mark I Starley Metfords having the earlier style, and all other Marks having the later style. So one might take the visual cues between these two rifles as being indicative generally of the entire family. Here we see the Mark I Lee Metford at the top, and the Mark I Magazine Lee Enfield at the bottom. Perhaps the most distinguishing feature, especially from afar, is the placement of the sling. More on that later. They both have the distinctive semi-pistol grip stock and the Lee type box magazine. They both have long range dial sights. Note the lack of grooves in the forestock of the Magazine Lee Enfield. Markings are found on the Magazine Lee Enfield in the same place, underneath the bolt handle. In this case, Branco's rifle was made by Birmingham Small Arms in 1896. The Magazine Lee Enfield retained the Magazine Cutoff, which was consistent with the doctrine of the era. When opened, it afforded access to the increased capacity of 10 rounds, the Mark I Lee Metford only having 8. As with all Enfield barreled rifles, the Knox form, the square's projection at the breech end of the barrel, is marked with an E. The rear aperture for the dial sight remained in its customary position and raised for firing. The dial proper was consistent with earlier marks. Here we see some detail of the breech area of the two rifles. Some key differences come to be identified here. The safety catch, fitted to the cocking piece of the Lee Enfield, was a feature of the Mark II Star Lee Metford and carried on for use with the Lee Enfield. Note also the indentation cut in the stock underneath the magazine cutoff of the Lee Metford and the lack thereof on the Lee Enfield. The later pattern dust cover, adopted on the Mark II Lee Metford, was held in place by its own spring pressure and a series of lugs, as opposed to the series of screws used to secure it on the Mark I Lee Metford. The bolt head was left uncovered, starting with the Mark II Lee Metford, unlike the Mark I Lee Metford, which had a special cover specific to the bolt head. One main difference between the Mark I Lee Metford and the remainder of the family was in the magazine. Initially, an eight round single stack it was changed to a 10 round double stack variety from the Mark II Lee Metford. You can see the obvious differences in upper dimensions here. Another difference is the curved forward corner of the 10 round magazine versus the sharp angle on the eight. The nose caps were different too. Although similar in function and form, the latter marks lacked the additional and separate barrel band. By the time of the Boer War in 1899, Cleaning rods, which had then become clearing rods, were discontinued for all 303 rifles. Branco's Lee Enfield, in the guise of a rifle used during the Boer War, lacks such a feature. The handguard, although similarly arranged, had, by the time of the Mark I Star Lee Metford, become curved at the front edge to assist removal, instead of the square version found on the Mark I Lee Metford. The curved version then carrying on through the rest of the family of rifles. Although safety catches would be abandoned on the Mark I Star Lee Metford and the Mark II Lee Metford, they were reintroduced on the Mark II Star Lee Metford, although in a different position. The earlier rifle had the safety catch installed in a position that will be very familiar to shooters of the SMLE and No. 4 rifles, pulled to the rear to be applied, and pushed forward for full functioning of the rifle. The later marks had their safety catch mounted on the cocking piece, with up being the safe position and down being for firing. At the time of this video, the two rifles were fitted with two different sights, which perhaps begs a few seconds discussion. When Enfield rifling was adopted, it was thought that a certain amount of horizontal drift would be imparted on the trajectory of the bullet, and a corresponding but significant adjustment was made to the front sight as a way to compensate for this. The entire front sight block was positioned 0.03 inches to the left of the axis of the bore, while the barley corn on top was placed a further 0.02 inches to the left of the axis of the sight block. This gave a total offset of 0.05 inches. It was found that the rifles shot to the right by some 6 inches at 100 yards, and as the rifles had only really begun to see service during the Boer War, this was when it was discovered contributing in large part to the lackluster standard of musketry exhibited by British troops during that conflict.
One of the fixes used to remedy this problem was the introduction of a backsight made with an offset notch in the slider and cap to correct the error. My rifle, having been fitted with an infield barrel, has been fitted with such a sight, while the Lee Enfield has not, as seen here. The butt plate was changed from the Mark II Lee Metford to a brass one from the steel of the earlier versions. And, as already mentioned, the position of the sling was mounted rearward with the fitting of a butt swivel. As well, the front swivel moved from a position on the nose cap down to the barrel band. It is this feature alone which perhaps identifies an early Mark Lee Metford from the rest of the family. All in all, the changes were incremental especially after the adoption of the newer body style of the Mark II Lee Metford. But generally, the profile of the entire family of rifles remained relatively consistent. Loading and firing of the Mark I Lee Enfield was conventional and followed very much in the same vein as earlier Marks. Especially on active service, the magazine would be charged. On the word of command, charge magazines, the cutoff was opened and the bolt turned and drawn to the rear. Then, one at a time, rounds were drawn from the pouch or in this case the bandolier, and fed into the magazine by placing them on the platform and pushing down. The nature of the double stack magazine meant that the curious method of charging the older single stack magazine of the Mark I Lee Metford was unnecessary. As you can see, charging the 10 round magazine was a relatively lengthy process. Once the requisite number of rounds had been placed in the magazine, the cutoff was closed, keeping pressure on the top round. The bolt was closed and springs were eased. On the command ready, the bolt was opened and a round placed on top of the closed cutoff. The bolt was pushed sharply home and turned down. If necessary, the safety catch was applied. After an indication of a target, which included a range, the sights were set. On the word present, in the case of volley firing, or commence in the case of independent firing. The safety catch was pushed down, the weapon brought to the shoulder, the target was covered, and the trigger pressed. Of course, in volley firing, the word of command fire preceded any trigger pressing. The process was repeated for the number of rounds specified in the fire order. Independent firing was intended to be a measured affair of moderate intensity. As far as rate of fire was concerned, it fell in between volley firing with its extreme control of ammunition expenditure and magazine independent fire, which was intended to be delivered at a man's best rate that also maintained accuracy and composure. To transition from independent to magazine independent fire, first a whistle was used to stop firing. This was followed by magazine ready and then a resumption of the engagement. In instances of time-critical engagement, undoubtedly there would be no stoppage of fire, and the men would simply open the cutoffs and deliver magazine fire on the command, magazine ready. On the word of command, unload, the cutoff was closed, the bolt cycled and springs eased. What follows is a side-by-side -side comparison of the Mark I Lee Metford and the Mark I Lee Enfield. After charging the magazine with five rounds, two rounds independent are fired, followed by three rounds magazine independent. You will at once notice the similarities generally, but also some subtle differences with the Metford. Charging of the magazine must be done by inserting the rim of the round first, while, as demonstrated earlier, the Lee Enfield needs only the rounds to be placed flat on the platform and pushed straight down.
So Branko, you're using some slightly different kit to what viewers of the channel might see me using uh, in the past videos on the Lee Metford. Would you mind explaining to us what it is that you're wearing? What I've got on is what the typical uh, trooper of the Canadian Mounted Rifles would be wearing. Um, we've got the uh, Oliver Pattern belt. This is reproduced by What Price Glory. We've got uh, the 1897 Bandolier up here, which is the only method of uh, carrying ammunition that was issued to the Mounted Rifles. And the Oliver Pattern Bayonet Frog, which has two compartments, one for the bayonet and one for an entrenching tool which was never carried. So Branko, you mentioned that the, the belt was from uh, the company What Price Glory. Uh, the bandolier, however, is that an original? No, this is one that I reproduced myself. It's made of three different thicknesses of leather, as close as I can get it to the original, which uh, were a lot of them were belt thickness. Uh, they're made uh, fairly uh, simple. The loops have to be wet formed and then sewn on. Uh, the flap covers usually were of a material that had a marbling to it, though there are some examples of uh, original bandoliers with fairly smooth leather like this one. Very nice. And how many rounds does it hold? 50 rounds. 50 rounds. So I'm looking at about 25 on the chest and evidently there's more on the back. Is there's that more right? on the back, yes. However, not very easily accessible. It would have to be released from the belt as it is hooked on over here and then slid around to be able to access the other 50 or 25. Right, so that sounds like a, a good theory, but perhaps difficult in practice. Yes. As you may have noticed, Branko is dressed differently than I, though in kit that was very much contemporary to mine. He's dressed as a mounted infantryman of the Canadian Mounted Rifles, who served in South Africa during the Boer War. Mounted infantry were, in effect, the fourth arm, along with infantry, cavalry, and artillery, although not one that received particular attention. Much like the original intent of dragoons on the battlefield, who by the 19th century had become purely cavalry in nature, the mounted infantry were, as the name suggests, infantrymen who trained on horses and used them for mobility, but dismounted to fight on foot, rather than mounted with sword, lance, or carbine like the cavalry. Mounted infantry didn't have to be mounted on horses either. Famously, in the Sudan campaign of 1884-85, the Camel Corps, formed from units across the British Army, including cavalry and infantry, were mounted on, as the name suggests, camels for mobility. Fighting, of course, was conducted in a dismounted guise. Rather than formed regiments with their own identity, the mounted infantry arm was made up of a series of detachments who came together to form the somewhat ad hoc nature of the units within the arm. They kept their own cap badges and accoutrements, but were equipped with mounted duty kit such as spurs, breeches, and very often bandoliers instead of the full gamut of valise equipment. Mounted infantry proved their worth all over the empire during the late Victorian era. In South Africa during the Zulu Wars, in Burma, and again in South Africa during the Boer War, where units like the Canadian Mounted Rifles and a large number of other units, such as the Imperial Yeomanry and the infamous Bushveldt Carbineers of Breaker Morant fame, served. The Mounted Infantry Arm was disbanded in 1913. By that time, much to the chagrin of some die-hard traditionalists, the cavalry had taken on the role of dismounted action, a function they performed with admirable effect during the opening months of the Great War. If you'd like to support the channel, please stop by our Patreon page. The link is in the description below. Thank you.